welcome, friends, to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast that dares to talk about setback and failure, but not so we can commiserate. It's so we can elevate. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and our mission today is to offer you the hope that your crucible experiences, those tragedies and challenges you faced or are facing at this moment, don't define you. They refine you. They didn't happen to you. They happened for you. And I don't know anybody who who knows this terrain better than the founder of Beyond the Crucible, the host of this program, and my friend, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, we've got a a special one of our dialogue episodes uh, this week, and uh, I know uh, this uh, this one is particularly close to your heart. Absolutely. Uh, This is going to be a fun one and um, a very compelling uh, topic we're going to be talking about today. And this episode, listener, is uh, one of the uh, what, what we're calling the series within the show that we do. And this is uh, we're calling and the name of that series is Stories from the Book Beyond the Crucible, um, which is Warwick's Wall Street Journal bestseller released in 2022. Um, and it's an important book, folks, because without that book, there wouldn't be a Beyond the Crucible. Uh, which initially was called Crucible Leadership, and then we changed. You know, we 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 assess the brand and now we're beyond the crucible. So without that book, which Warwick started and led him to found uh, what is now beyond the crucible, uh, we wouldn't even be here. So that's how important the book is. Uh, and what we're doing each month, because Warwick spent a lot of time working on that book and it, yes, part of it is his story, but part of it is also the stories of others who've been through crucibles and how they bounced back to a life of significance. Um, and so what we're doing here once a month is we're taking one of the stories about one of the people that Warwick talks about, writes about in the book, and we're unpacking it a little bit to to take one lesson that you can take to apply to your own journey moving beyond your crucible. And this month, we are going to look at William Wilberforce um, and what he can teach us about self-sacrifice. So, Warwick, who was William Wilberforce? Well, Gary, that is a good question. Uh, William Wilberforce is definitely one of my heroes. Um, He is most famous for abolishing the slave trade uh, in Great Britain. Uh, And it was pretty much to consume his whole life. Uh, It was a very big challenge. The slave trade pulled in the equivalent of millions, if not billions worth of pounds. So, uh, anytime you're doing something that's going to have a huge impact on the economy and money and interests, it's going to be a challenge. People tend to vote with their wallets uh, versus morality. Uh, sad, but true. So this was almost an impossible climb, that an impossible task that William Wilberforce uh, set upon. But uh, just a bit of background on who he was. He was born in England in 1759. Uh, He went to college at Cambridge University. And there he met what was to be his lifelong friend, uh, William Pitt, who became uh, future prime minister. In fact, William Pitt was actually the second uh, longest serving prime minister in uh, British history of 18 years. So Wilberforce became uh, a member of parliament at a very young age, age 21. And actually, his good buddy, William Pitt, became prime minister at age 23, which it's almost ridiculous to think of how young that is. <laughs> right. In the US, you're constitutionally barred from being president until you're 35, but I guess not so in Britain. So, there is a famous quote of, um, uh, of Pitt in which uh, when he became uh, prime minister, he, you have to go before the king, King George III. Uh, and uh, the king said, well, Mr. Pitt, you're awfully young. We're 23, certainly is young. And Pitt said, well, I shall endeavor to remedy that in time, uh, which he did. <laughs> 18 years later, wasn't so young. Right. Um, anyway, they were best of friends. And, um, you know, Wilberforce, uh, you know, if there was a high school yearbook, he would be most likely to succeed. He was bright eloquent, outgoing, the life of the party. And if you had, in fashionable London at the time, if you had a dinner party, you were going to invite Wilberforce. He would just make your party bright, eloquent, outgoing, 
the kind of person who's going to be prime minister one day. He was a member of the Conservative Party, but his life changed somewhere around 1784 through 1786. So um, he became, uh, over a period of time, more religious. He became a committed Christian. And really, it's not a fashionable thing in most times. Certainly back then, uh, it wasn't going to help your political career. So he was thinking at the time, maybe I should devote my whole life to ministry. Often when you have a religious conversion experience, that's often what you think, oh, I need to go into ministry. Well, a friend of his and mentor, John Newton, said to him, you know, William, you can serve God much better by remaining in Parliament. Now, John Newton, that name might be familiar to some. He was a former captain of a, of a slave ship who, again, had a religious conversion experience. And he penned the, one of the best-known hymns of all times, Amazing Grace. And really, when you think about that hymn, it's John Newton thinking, I'm the most wretched person. The things I've done, you talk about sins, it's not much worse than being a slave trader. How could I could possibly be forgiven? Um, so John Newton, uh, he knew something about being forgiven, about purpose in life, and he was the one that encouraged Wilberforce, uh, you know, you should stay uh, in Parliament. And speaking of Amazing Grace, if people want to learn more about Wilberforce and not read one of the many books uh, on him, there is a great movie uh, back in 2006 starring uh, Joan Grifford as um, William Wilberforce. You, uh, more contemporary uh, folks might remember him from the Fantastic Four, believe it or yes, not. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> he was in that movie. Uh, and... Uh, uh, William Pitt in the movie is played by Benedict Cumberpatch. These days, very well known as one of the premier actors of our time. All-star cast. Back to Wilberforce. In 1787, Wilberforce begins the work of his life to try and abolish the slave trade in the British Empire. Again, you've got an industry that's bringing in enormous sums of money. At the time, uh, something incredibly difficult. So in 1789... Wilberforce introduces the first of many bills to abolish the slave trade. In fact, he introduced a bill 18 times that year. He was not one to give up. And it went down in flames, 163 votes to 88. Not an auspicious beginning. But Wilberforce was not one to give up. In 1792, he introduced yet another bill to abolish the slave trade. Now, this succeeded... But there was what contemporary folks might call a poison pill. There was an amendment to the bill that passed that said that the slave trade was going to be abolished gradually. Well, what does that mean? You know, uh, not much solace for the poor enslaved people. Wilberforce, yes, this was a step in the right direction, but Wilberforce was not one to give up. And so in 1807, he introduced yet another bill and the slave trade was abolished in the British Empire. It took many years to achieve. There were petitions over the years with hundreds of thousands of British people signing the petition, pleading with Parliament to abolish the slave trade. It was full court press. But Wilberforce wasn't satisfied, because it's one thing to abolish the slave trade, but what about the poor people who were already enslaved? What about them? Well, that uh, obviously uh, was not going to be the end of it. So then Wilberforce spent the rest of his life, and in 1833, after Wilberforce, you know, by then an old man, after Wilberforce had retired from Parliament, the uh, Slavery Ab Abolition Act was finally passed in 1833. And believe it or not, it was passed three days before Wilberforce died. Mm. So by the time Wilberforce died, he knew the work of his life, the abolition of the slave trade, and the abolition of slavery itself was passed. When you look, talk about self-sacrifice, um, the great British historian G.M. Trevelyan, he uh, said this. He said of uh, Wilberforce's 20-year battle to abolish the slave trade, that it was one of the turning points in the history of the world. Now, that is quite something to be yeah. said that what you did was one of the turning points in the history of the world. And this is by one of the most eminent historians 
around. And then uh, Trevelyan also said um, that with all these talents, he, Wilberforce, would probably have been Pitt's success as prime minister if he had preferred party to mankind. And what we're doing here with this uh, series within the show is taking folks from your book and then pulling out just kind of just one learning that we can apply to our own pursuit of a life of significance. And when you started talking about Wilberforce, you know, there are probably folks who were like, wow, that's a great example of perseverance. And it is indeed a great example of perseverance. And that could stand on its own as what the lesson is, but for um, what you just hinted at at the end there, um, his his political fortunes, what they could have been. So, so talk a little bit about why, right? It's not perseverance. There was something else that made you want to write about him. Why did you, uh, you respect him, um, uh, you're intrigued by his story, but there's a reason why you put him in your book, Crucible Leadership. Why was that? Wilberforce was definitely somebody that really did do the right thing no matter what. Um, he was most likely to he was most likely to succeed. I think in those early years in Parliament, very well liked. But once he had, um, I think, what he would term a religious conversion, and became a committed Christian, by devoting his whole life to abolishing the slave trade and slavery, the arc of his life changed. He was certainly respected by many in the country and even respected by his adversaries, but he was a lightning rod. He was going against the moneyed interests of the country. He was ruffling feathers. Even though he engaged in debate in a polite way, he never um, attacked people personally. He just advocated for what he believed in. It really appealed to people's better angels, to you know their underlying morality versus the pocketbook. But by doing all of this, even though I'm sure a lot of people still respected him, uh, there was no way he was going to be prime minister. You right. know, he's not going to unite the factions of the party as we hear in modern day language. I mean, yes, you would have some people in parliament that were people of faith, people of morality and conviction that it would have, in, in, you know, they would have supported him no matter what. But basically, the short story is by deciding to make his whole life about abolishing the slave trade and slavery, it meant the chances of him being prime minister, I don't know if it went to zero, but probably pretty much pretty close. He was too controversial a figure, too much of a lightning rod. Um, it wasn't going to happen. And he knew that. It wasn't like he didn't know what he was doing. Um, he was a smart man, but for him, his beliefs, his values, this cause, I mean, what greater cause can you imagine, certainly at the time, of abolishing the slave trade and slavery? Right. I mean, it's hard to think of anything that was uh, more morally indispensable, more morally reprehensible than the existence of slavery and the slave trade. This was going to be his cause, but he sacrificed his career, his self-interest, um, for a higher purpose, and that's something. It was it was an enormous cost. Probably uh, certainly had um, consequences on his health, uh, and it was. It's easy to look back when something is accomplished, and saying, "Wow, look at what he did!" But this was no sure thing. Right. This went against, you know, massive amounts of money and muddied interests, and I'm sure there were years where friends would have said, "Give it up." It's ruining right. your health. It's destroying your career. You're not going to win this. There's too much against this. You know, money's going to meet. You know, money's going to beat morality any day. That's what. A, that's what a lot of people would have said back then. Money versus morality. It's not close. Money always wins. Right. And it often does. Uh, but somehow, it's like he didn't really care. Sure, people know Wilberforce now, but at the time, he wasn't thinking that. He's thinking, look, I may, get my, I may go down in flames, but that's not the point. I will try with my last dying breath to abolish the slave trade and abolish slavery. And um, that's what I really admire about him. It wasn't about getting his name in lights or history. It was doing the right thing, even though it was a death knell to his political career. 
Right. And here's a quote I pulled. I pulled a quote uh, from him that, that dovetails very nicely in what you just said. He said this, to live our lives and miss that great purpose we were designed to accomplish is truly a sin. It is inconceivable that we could be bored in a world with so much wrong to tackle, so much ignorance to reach, and so much misery we could alleviate. And this man, it's important to note, is a politician, folks. I mean, th that to me is one of the most amazing things about this story is that he wasn't a Freemason who self-sacrificed. This is a guy, he's a politician who self-sacrificed. And we know from our own experience, both what we know historically and what we see perhaps day to day, that that may not be the first impulse of some politicians, right? So that, that makes it to me even more uh, laudatory what he did because of the position he was in where he could have really, right, grabbed power. And he didn't want power, he wanted impact, right? Exactly. It's really, you know, the power of a life of integrity, the power of a life of uh, self-sacrifice, of being committed to the cause, not his self-interest. Yes, in one sense, he was born for this role. Uh, he was, it was certainly, we talk about God-given callings, it was certainly a calling on his life, the purpose of his life. You had friends around him like you know, the great John Newton, um, who, as we said, uh, wrote um, that wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, they realized this was a man of intelligence and eloquence who was well-liked in Parliament, who better than William Wilberforce to lead the fight to abolish the slave trade and abolish slavery. Here's this remarkable story, and surely, um, I can't think of too many higher purposes than this, but he did indeed sacrifice his career and his self-interest, which as you rightly say, Gary, politicians, irrespective of their political uh, beliefs, rarely seem to sacrifice their career for what they believe in. It just seems all too rare. Right. And that's one of the reasons why this story resonates so much through the ages, and it, and it resonates right now as, as we're talking about it. But right not many of us are going to find ourselves in a situation like Wilberforce did, right? Um, so uh, listeners may be wondering, how is the example that you've just unpacked? How is the example of his life, the self-sacrifice that he, that he summoned, that he lived out? How is that example relevant to us today? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I think of, um, just to start with talking about self-sacrifice, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines self-sacrifice as being willing to give up your own interest in order to help others or advance a cause. And so, when you think of our own lives, we might think, well, we're not William Wilberforce. You know, we're not giving up our life to abolish the slave trade. You know, how could we ever do something that impressive, that grand, that um, something that will change the world? But I think for each of us in our own lives, we have choices uh, in our families, friends, neighborhood, in our career. And certainly there are times in which uh, if we ignore our deeply held values and beliefs, it can be better for our career. Just turn a blind eye to that kind of deal. It's not illegal. Oh, sure, it's unethical, unethical but okay, who cares about ethics? So long as we don't break the law, or at least if we break the law, let's just make sure we don't get found out. And that's really what where the line is for some people in business. And you might say, well, I'm not willing to do that. You know, and or if you're not going to play ball, maybe you'll be fired or maybe you'll just be sidelined. You won't get that promotion. Um, that's often a real cost in life. You know, if we make a decision that in our marriages, with our you know, lives, communities, especially in our careers, that we are going to live in light of our deeply held values and beliefs that is very likely to have a cost. Um, and it will, could well be limiting on the money that we will earn and you know, our careers. Uh, so you don't have to be religious necessarily to um, take this approach. Uh, you know, you just, if you live in life, you have a deeply held values and beliefs. Um, yeah, you're just going to be seen often as some person that's, um, holier than thou or just, uh, 
I don't know, on a crusade for something, you know, you know, it's not something that's going to win you a popularity contest uh, most of the time, or certainly not all of the time. So, you know, living in light of your deeply held values and beliefs, it's certainly quite possible that that will entail a life of self-sacrifice, which is not necessarily what you try to do. You don't try to be some martyr, but it's certainly not a way to win a popularity contest. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we talk a lot about legacy and, um, you know, uh, at your funeral, what's going to be said. Uh, typically, at your funeral, as we've often discussed, it's not going to be said, uh, well, so-and-so was worth X millions of dollars or they did this, that, and the other, and they were head of this company or this organization. It's going to be who you are or who you were as a person. So if you want to live your legacy, you want to live in light of your deeply held values and beliefs. Because uh, that's something that your kids and friends and relatives are going to admire. So, uh, But it's not an easy choice. Day to day, living for your values and beliefs and not career self-interest, that will very often entail self-sacrifice, even yeah. if that's not what you're intending. Right. And I mean, I, just talking about this brought to mind something that happened for me along these very lines. And it wasn't way up there with what Wilberforce did, but I was editorial page editor of a newspaper in Palm Springs, California. And um, it was time to endorse um, certain candidates and ballot initiatives. And my, my moral compass was set to a place where I could not I would not have felt right about writing an editorial about endorsing this ballot initiative. So I had to make the decision in my head and my heart that if that was the vote that the editorial board took, um, and sometimes, you know, as you probably well, as you certainly well know, Warwick, from your newspaper experience, sometimes you got an editorial board of five people and, and something can pass on a one, four vote because the one is the publisher who says, I want to do that. Um, and um, I had to make the determination and it was scary. It was not easy to do, but to say my values, my morality, what I stand for is more important than this job. And if my saying it, Nope, I'm not going to write that editorial. I can't do it. It's going to cost me my job, so be it. As it turns out, that didn't have to happen because we actually voted the other way as a board and it was all fine. So, But I went through that exercise and I can tell you, um, and the movie um, Amazing Grace does a good job of, of, of what Wilberforce went through. It's not an easy process. You have to constantly recommit yourself to your values uh, to be able to walk this out, especially for any period of time. So um, uh, that is one of the takeaways I get from this, Warwick. Uh, listeners are, are I'm, I'm sure, interested in what are your takeaways from the story of William Wilberforce, not only as you described here, as you wrote in your book, and as you've studied for much of your life. Yeah, Gary. I mean, that example you gave is such a very good um, example. When you went into that editorial meeting, you didn't know the way folks were going to vote, the way the publisher right. was right. going to go. So some that's typically happens. You're making a moral decision that I am not going to, you know, I cannot write the editorial. And if that means I get fired, so be it. And it's not like, oh, if I get fired, no big deal. You know, I can I got plenty of financial cushion. I mean, I'm sure you were like most people that this is going to be a big deal and have significant right. consequences yep. if you were going For to sure. be fired. And right. so, you know, just because the outcome worked out doesn't denigrate what you're saying because you didn't know that was going to happen. Right. You had no reason to believe that they would say, oh, well done, Gary. Good for you standing <laughs> for your moral principles. Well done. In fact, we'll give you a raise and a promotion. Yeah. I mean, that's not the way it works typically. And so, that's really a good example from real life. Um, you know, when I think about uh, Wilberforce, um, one of the things we talk all the time on Beyond the Crucible is that life should be about leading a life of significance, a life on purpose dedicated to serving others. It's hard to think of too many people that led a life uh, of significance more than William Wilberforce. I mean, being involved your whole life abolishing the slave trade and abolishing slavery 
clearly by anybody's definition, that is a life on purpose, a life of significance dedicated to serving others. That kind of legacy, uh, his kids, grandkids, um, uh, really the people of Britain, people of the world, uh, would um, respect. This is before, obviously, uh, slavery was abolished uh, in the U.S., which happened in, in the Civil War. It was before the slave trade was abolished in the United States. It was really you know, one of the first places that this was ever done. He was doing something that was um, a pioneer. Um, so, you know, to me, one of the, the takeaways is um, doing the right thing no matter what, uh, living in light of your values and your deeply held beliefs. That, to me, what li- is what life should be about. So, I think Wilberforce is a great model for us in terms of doing the right thing no matter what, living in light of your values and beliefs. And in that sense, living a life of self-sacrifice. You live in light of your values and beliefs. It will often mean that you'll be called to lead a life of self-sacrifice because you typically won't win a popularity contest. It won't be good for your career in most cases. But at the end of the day, you got to look at yourself in the mirror. you got to think of what those who admire you and love you um, think. And you know you want to be able to respect yourself. You want to think, well, whether I won or lost, I lived in light of my most deeply held values and beliefs. And I think at that point, you can respect yourself and, and uh, in some ways um, believe in yourself and uh, think, okay, I, I lived a life that I can be proud of. I lived a, a well-lived life. And ultimately, on our deathbed, we want to feel like that we can respect ourselves and that we lived a life that we, in some small way, can be proud of. To me, that's uh, a huge part of what life's about. Yep. As you've sort of landed the plane there, um, thought pops in my mind. We talk a lot at Beyond the Crucible about how crucibles change the trajectory of your life. We often don't focus, though, on the other side of that. And it's evident in William Wilberforce's life. His self-sacrifice, his self-sacrifice changed the trajectory of humankind. You know, I love what you said there, Gary, because in one sense, sometimes doing the right thing creates its own crucible, creates its own life of self-sacrifice. And by William Wilberforce standing up for enslaved people and spending his life trying to abolish the slave trade and slavery, uh, you know, there were times in which he was not very popular. He was pilloried. He was uh, scorned. You watch the movie on uh, Amazing Grace, you'll see plenty of scenes in which life is not easy and people are saying, you know, give it up. It's frustrating. He's losing that first year that he introduced uh, that first bill to abolish the slave trade. He, he brought it up 18 times, failed each one of them. That must have been soul crushing. So, so sometimes when you stand up for what's right, uh, it might lead to a life of self-sacrifice and you might bring a crucible on yourself. But this kind of crucible is one I think Wilberforce would say, I do it again. If me going through a crucible of years of trying to abolish the slave trade, if that succeeds, it's worth it. And he would probably say, what I'm going through uh, pales into insignificance compared to the crucible of those enslaved people who were on those slave ships and in slavery. Uh, So, yeah, sometimes doing the right thing can bring a crucible on. And we're, we're not about saying, oh, please, you know, bring crucibles on yourself. But in this particular case, Hmm. if doing the right thing brings a crucible on yourself, I think you might well say, I'm willing to make that sacrifice. I'm willing to make that choice. Now, that's the plane on the ground um, at the runway. Uh, That'll wrap up our second series within the show on stories from the book, Crucible Leadership. We'll turn the page next month to another story to help you turn the page and move beyond your crucible to lead a life of significance. 
See you next week. If you enjoyed this episode, learned something from it, we invite you to engage more deeply with those of us at Beyond the Crucible. Visit our website, beyondthecrucible.com, to explore a plethora of offerings to help you transform what's been broken into breakthrough. A great place to start? Our free online assessment, which will help you pinpoint where you are on your journey beyond your crucible and to chart a course forward. See you next week. Thank you.